and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's retro review is 1989's Elder Secrets of Glorantha for RuneQuest 3rd Edition by Chaosium. Okay, first a bit of history. Elder Secrets of Glorantha is a box set of books that provide information on previously unknown or little-known secrets of Glorantha's Third Age, mostly to do with the Elder Races, the Mostali, the Eldre Army and the Uz as well as the lesser races of Glorantha. Also included is information on the strange things and places of the world. Additionally, it was the final book produced for the third edition of the game. OK, to the box. The cover by Nick Smith appears to depict a spellcasting dragon and is actually not too bad. Inside the box we have three items. A map depicting the major human and elder race regions, book one entitled Secrets Book, and book two entitled Elder Races Book. Let's start with book one. Book 1 begins with Mysteries of Glorantha. This details the mysterious beings, places and the things of the world, all of which have been speculated on by scholars. It begins with discussions on those parts of Glorantha that are not well documented and it discusses how this is good for DMs. It details the land of Dagori Inkarth, the most ancient of all troll kingdoms that remain strange and hostile to outsiders. Dorastor, the land southwest of Peloria that is ruled by the mysterious and cruel Ralzakark, the unicorn-headed king of the Brews. The Elfwoods, Kralorla, the oriental part of Glorantha, Romalia, a cruel land where the troll god Zaraxavan is worshipped in human form, and Vormain, a closed ethnocentric society where nobody really knows what the natives look like. To the south we have Hornilio, a bog-covered brackish marsh populated by thousands of hostile goblins or red elves ruled by a cruel goblin sorceress, Carganillor. Chemos, a land where the natives practice magic in the form of sculptures and who constantly fight a fearsome enemy called the Gorges. Kothar, a land of unknown culture where the Kresh wagon folk are alleged to come from. Sosgangio, a swampland that covers the entire eastern coast of Pamaltella, that is populated by three tribes of humans who believe that they are the last surviving humans in the world. Wangarisi, a land populated by dinosaurs. And Zamakil, the home of a peaceful plains people who claim to be the descendants of a great ancient empire that destroyed itself. Next up is Unique Mysteries of Glorantha. First up is the block, the two kilometre tall block of true stone that struck down Wackboth during God time and the most holy place for worshippers of Stormbull. The top of the block is populated by a family of wise griffins who defend it. We have the City of Wonders, an abandoned city surrounded by an impenetrable dome that keeps people out. The city is only accessible by 12 people in all of Glorantha. Next is Charg, a land cut off by the Syndic's ban, a curse which sealed the land. We have the egg of Arangalos Karastomabor. This is a 50 metre tall floating egg of unknown purpose that has intrigued scholars since time began. The egg has a different colour depending on the race viewing it and it seems to appear at various places in the world at random, staying for between 17 to 100 days at a time. We have the fading lands next which seem to fade in and out of reality like the hidden greens of the Praxian wastelands and Castle Blue. Following this we have the floating isle. A great body of land that flies slowly about Glorantha. When it passes overhead it is said to block out the sun and bring disaster to all in its shadow. Next is Harraj Allenberg, the walking fort. It was built by the ancient dwarfs and is a large stone castle that walked upon eight legs about the countryside. We have the Hell Crack. This is a crack in the earth that is hundreds of kilometres long and about one kilometre wide and is so deep that if anything falls into it, it falls for weeks until it reaches the centre of the earth where there is then a passage that leads back to the surface. We also have the Iron Forts, a group of 11 forts in the Shan Shan Mountains that are all exactly the same. We have the Juggernaut, a tremendous wheel that is 5 kilometres wide and 10 in diameter that crushes everything it rolls over. Lost Brithos is next, an isle that vanished from the face of Glorantha, but that some people still think there is a way to. We then have the Storm of Pier, a magical moat of dust that helps the person it attaches itself to that multiplies as the demands of the person get bigger until it becomes a maelstrom 10 kilometres wide of fine dust. There's also the Three Dragon Mountains and the Top of the World. These are located in Mineria and Dragon Pass. Two of them are fairly normal mountains, Vent and Stormwall. Wintertop, however, is an oddity. It is a mountain that is 12,000 metres tall and only 30 kilometres wide, which makes it look like a needle that rises to the sky. Top of the World is a tall peak that has never been conquered by any reputable mortal, and indeed another mountain is said to sit atop it reaching into the sky. Lastly we have the Tunnelled Hills and the Plateau of Statues, a kingdom ruled by a demon child of Cacodemon that breeds with everything and creates unnameable things for the wastes. The Plateau of Statues is a difficult to climb land formation covered at the top by gigantic statues and ruins. It is patrolled by three creatures, Blind, Brow and another unnamed one. They are huge and made of stone 
and they act as caretakers to the plateau, and old magic is said to exist there. Next up is a section on the secrets of dragonkind. Here we have discussion on the various levels of dragonhood. At the top of the tree we have Roboros and the cosmic dragon of which everything was born. Following this we have mythic or ancestral dragons, creatures powerful enough to confront gods, creatures so immense that they are the size of oceans. We then have true dragons. These live on the surface world but are so big that they are considered more pieces of geography than creatures. There are a few known true dragons, the black dragon, Creasy Yor, the red dragon, the green dragon and the dragon of Jarn, as well as all those that exist in Kraloria such as the August dragon, Gudunya, the Emperor dragon and Thrunhindar, the dragon of the waters. Next on the tree are dream dragons. This is what people generally mean when they speak of dragons and these are monstrous things capable of destroying armies. They appear genderless and don't grow older or larger. Following that we have dragon newts and then dinosaurs which are considered to be descended from dragon newts, magisaurs which are said to be the product of damaged dragon eggs, wyverns, worms who are shamanistic magical creatures and finally store worms, foul chaotic creatures that are considered the poor relations of dragon kind. We have a nice interlude on adventurers visiting a dragon newt city and following this we have a section on draconic law. Here it discusses dragon newt roads which seem to have a strange warping effect on dragon newt travelling them, the draconic hills and some information on some friendly draconic teachers which is accompanied by some truly awful artwork. We also have some information on a powerful draconic healing spell, pre-healing and some information on Krolorula and its dragon emperor. The next section is called Monsters and Terrors. Here we have a few fantasy staples like the two-headed snake, the Amphisbena, the Catobla Pass, the Hippogriff, the Nasa Beam, a strange creature that walks on all four of its noses, and the Red Cap, an evil undead type. Following this, we have the list of terrors. First up is the Crimson Bat, an extremely powerful creature that is under the control of the Lunar Empire, updated for 3rd edition. Following that, we have Quim, the spawn of Third and the Devil, a strange creature which appears to be three enormous bodies attached at the head that pulls off bits of its body that transform into gorps to throw at their enemies. The Mother of Monsters, which is a hundred meter tall creature that births chaos creatures daily, and the Chaos Gaggle, which consists of Brindithium, or the Chaos Goat, Ergan, the Slime Snake, Zeech, the Slithering Whale, and Bastok, the Chaos Wyvern. Next up is a section called The Magical Geology of Glorantha. This section discusses the bones of the gods, Glorantha Metals. It talks about the various metals and how they relate to the various races, and also how they can be enchanted. It also gives a table that matches the various major gods to their sacred metal. Following this we have a section that discusses the blood of the gods, magical crystals. This talks about the various types of magical crystals and what they can do. This ranges from being magical focus crystals that will enhance the effects of for example healing, to unpowered crystals that can store magic points. Following this we have information on the properties of true stone and adamant. The next section covers the sky. This discusses the various heavenly bodies and includes the constellations of Arkat, the dark spot which is supposed to be the star of Sheng Solaris that was extinguished by the Emperor of the Lunar Empire, the red moon which is the body of the red goddess fixed in the sky and Yelm the sun god. Lastly we have a section on Glorantham weather. In general it is what you would expect, however on Glorantham there are five seasons not four. Sea season, fire season, earth season, dark season and storm season. There's also a small season called sacred time but this is not considered major. Finally we have some interesting notes on hero questing and how the cult of Arkat preserved the secrets of it. Ok on to book 2. This book concerns itself with the races of Garantha and divides itself into 5 sections. The Mostali, the Eldrai Army, the Uz, the Lesser Elder Races and Scenario Outlines. Ok first up is the Mostali or Dwarves. The Mostali are the creation of Mostal the Maker. Mostal is the world machine, the system by which the world works. Mostal created the first rock Mostali in God time. This is followed by the lead, quicksilver, copper, tin, brass, silver and gold Mostali. When Umath separated the sky and the earth, the world machine was broken. The Mostali work tirelessly as a race to restore the world machine to full working order. They do this through their work and social interactions. Each type of Mostali has a predefined place in society that determines what they do. For example, rock Mostali are the miners and builders, whereas lead Mostali are plumbers and glass blowers and specialise in seals and wards. Mostali are your typical fantasy dwarves in appearance, but unlike other fantasy tropes, Mostali are manufactured as needed and have no family or marital life. They do not reproduce biologically and have no concept of sexuality. Also, while Mostali perform their duties as defined by their birth, they are effectively immortal. A dwarf's life is one of work to restore the world machine and their society is ruled by the Conclave or Decomony. Generally, dwarves are mistrusting of all other intelligent races. They see trolls as an inferior underground species, elves as everything that is wrong with the world, and humans as dishonest. Mostali are known to have developed and used gunpowder weapons and cannons that make other races very envious. 
The Mastali guard this technology with great fervour and will hunt down those who steal it. Religion wise they don't worship anything, they just follow the way of Mostal. Dwarfs are under the belief that eventually the world machine will be repaired and that god time will be restored. Dwarfs never learn spirit or divine magic, but they can be skilled sorcerers that have developed many useful spells that assist them in their day to day duties. Mostali have various heresies and apostasies. Dwarfs that define themselves as an individual with individual goals have become more commonplace since the second age, however those that do become mortal. There are those that believe in Octominism, the belief that the Mostali should break off all contact with the outside world. There is also open handism, the belief that the Mostali should practice open trading with other races and that non-dwarves can and should assist in the rebuilding of the world machine. Vegetarianism is considered a heresy amongst the Mostali also. Next we have a description of the various dwarf regions of Glorantha and following this we have some useful information on dwarf character creation. Following this we have information on Mostal himself. Most dwarves believe that Mostal is an anthropomorphic personification of natural forces and that the world machine is the combination of natural laws and slow evolution and that this personification is helpful for dwarves who seek to understand and control these forces. Mostal was known as the maker who delighted in creating new things from old things. His three greatest inventions were Helper, the first tool, the Spike and the Mostali. Mostal's parents were said to be Akos, the god of law, and Gata, the primitive earth, but the Mostali believed that he preceded both. Mostal's greatest companion was stone. At that time, stone was a living thing. In this age, stone is dead and lifeless. We have the creation of the Mostali detailed in the order that they were said to be created, with the rock Mostali first and the gold the last. Along with Mostal himself, the octagony of ancient minerals, as they are known, make up the number nine, a number equal to three times itself, and three sides make the unchangeable shape of the law rune. The spike is considered the greatest creation of Mostal, as it housed the celestial court, and it was considered the pin that held the world together. Although a dead god, Mostal is the source of the stasis rune, and is associated with the law and earth runes. Mostal's cult is known as the Way of Mostal, and defines the path of the Mostali, which in turn defines the universe. Dwarves that keep at their task live forever, a powerful incentive in itself. The Mostali believe that eventually the world machine will be repaired, and that the god time will be restored. Dwarves are not descended from Grandfather Mortal, and as such never die naturally, but equally, they have no afterlife. Dwarfs have no special holy days, every day working on the world machine is considered a holy day. However, at sacred time their tasks are different as the repair of the world machine draws nearer completion. Mostal doesn't have a cult per se. The way of Mostal is a way of life using the ancient system that has long been established. Each Mostali stronghold is ruled by a decimony, with each of the ten minerals represented. The ten minerals are rock, lead, quicksilver, copper, tin, brass, silver, gold, iron and diamond, with diamond dwarves being those that have reached perfection in their tasks. Mostali never learned divine or spirit magic. All dwarf magic is sorcery, and all dwarf sorcery is utilitarian in nature. Next, we have a list of Mostali sorcery spells, which are all about dwarf tasks such as stabilize masonry, produce flame, store sorcery, etc. And finally, we have a section on diamond dwarves. To become a diamond dwarf, you must have 2000% in 9 basic work skills. This normally takes around 700 years, and diamond dwarfs gain access to 5 special powers, all based around making their work life easier. Okay, next up is the Aldrai Army, or Elves of Glorantha. The Aldrai Army are human-shaped plant creatures of Glorantha, known as Elves to other races. There are different subtypes of Elf. Firstly, we have the Black Elves, or Varallans. Not true Elder Army, as they are more related to fungi than plants. They are short, thin and hairless, and grey with swollen craniums, and are telepathically linked to their siblings. Black Elves worship Mi Varalla, and create weird and wonderful mushroom concoctions. Next up is Blue Elves, or Merthoi. These live underwater, and cannot survive on land. They tend to underwater forests of seaweed, and can be found living in the open sea and in fresh water. Physically they are more like mermen than elves. They worship the sea goddess Methydria. The red elves or Slorifings are next. They are related to ferns and spore bearing plants, and are the most varied of the Aldri army, with many not even being humanoid. They are often referred to as goblins and live in swamps. They are an entirely male race who rely on mating with Olarians, a type of love nymph, to further their numbers. Next up are brown, green and yellow elves, or true elves as they are known. Also known as the Morelli, Ronkai and Ambili, these are what you would consider the generic elves. They are slight of frame, quick and intelligent. They are shy and live among the trees and consider themselves to be the caretakers of the forest. There are other types of Aldrai army such as dryads, runners and sprites. The average brown elf is short and thin and their eyes do not have whites or pupils. Their eyes and hair come in varied colours from violet to silver and some elves have leaves for hair. Elves look different depending on the type of tree they are associated with. All elves possess elf sense which allows them to detect the emotional state of a target by touch. It can also give details on the quality of soil. 
Elves reproduce by a seed that is planted in a secret place and tended to by the parents. All yellow elves are male and mate with dryads. Brown elves and green elves are male and female, although when a brown elf mates with a dryad, no offspring are produced. Elves are long-lived but mortal. They generally live until they are around two to three hundred years old, but those that are associated with giant redwoods can live up to a thousand years. As elves get older, they become more and more tree-like, with their skin becoming gnarly and hair-like leaves. Elves always live in the forests based on their species and build no buildings or cities, being naturally resistant to the elements. All elves are vegetarians, although yellow elves will occasionally eat a scrap of meat, fish or insect, but this is considered loathsome by other elves. Brown, yellow and green elves speak Aldry Army. Black elves speak Varallan and blue elves speak Merthoi. Elves tend to live out their lives in the forest with other elves. Brown elves do not sleep except at winter, and green and yellow elves undergo a daily period of rest. They have long memories and distrust humans, as well as hating dwarves and trolls. Elf forests are ruled by a council of elders, which are headed by the Great Tree. Amongst green, brown and yellow elves, worship of Aldraya is almost universal, although Yelmalio and Flamel are often worshipped on a secondary basis. Elves grow many plants that serve the functions of crafting, with the likes of spearheads, arrow shafts and clothing being viable. They tend to have the biggest influence in the Arinori jungle, Frenella, Ralios and Umathella, although they can generally be found where there are large forested areas. We also have information on creating brown, green and yellow elf characters. Next up is Aldraya. Aldraya is the child of Flamal and Analda. Such was Aldraya's beauty that two jealous gods fought over her and threatened to destroy her if she favoured the other. Aldraya took refuge with the celestial court on the slopes of the spike and thus the first tree was planted on the cosmic mountain. The fruit that grew upon her was planted far and wide and each fruit bare the great tree and each was called Aldraya. Each great tree bore fruit and covered the earth with vegetation. As the Green Age spread across Garantha, Aldraya took a husband called Shenas, a scion of the goddess of love. Together they brought forth the spirits of the forest, the dryads and the runners, and these beings filled the woods. Aldraya grew a race with Grandfather Mortal, and these were known as the people of the woods or the elves. Following the Green Age was the God's War, which left many woods burned, bruised or destroyed. During the God's War, death came into the hands of the elves, who used it to slay many dwarf foes, turning stone cold forever. Flamel was killed and in her grief, Ernalda withheld her bounty from the world and Aldraya followed suit, entering a great sleep and her children began to die. A group called the Protectors, led by the High Elf King, the leader of the unsleeping green elves, led a band of elves through the great darkness struggling to protect what remained of the forests. He was aided by Eroin in his endeavour. When the dawn came and life returned, Aldraya's place in the world had been prepared by the Protectors. The cult of Aldraya focuses on the plant rune, but it is modified by the earth and life runes. Aldraya is the ancestral goddess of sentient and non-sentient Aldraya army and is sometimes worshipped by humans. Elves are staunch foes of chaos, as it is the enemy of all living things. Most earth cults respect the Aldraya army and the sky gods are considered elf friends. Yelmalio and Yelm are also worshipped by the elves. Aldraya's cult has no influence in human affairs unless they live near a forest, and the cult of Aldraya governs all religious and social organisations. Aldraya is worshipped in the forest in groves. Although all Aldraya army consider themselves to be one race, they have fought each other at times. Each forest is governed by its own great tree, and these are held so sacred that only cult leaders and chosen initiates are told the location. Each great tree is an actual tree that survived since the gods' age, or were grafted from such a tree. The Great Tree will sit upon the Council of Elders, along with the High Elf King, Elder Sister and High Gardener, as well as the local Chief Priest of Associated Cults, and the usually empty seat of the Chosen One, a seat that is occasionally given to one spoken of in prophecy. The High Elf King represents the Elves, the Elder Sister the Dryads, and the High Gardener the Elder Sage Elves. The Great Tree represents all plant life. All Aldry army are automatically members of the Cult of Aldraya. Non-Elves such as humans and ducks are allowed to join, although dwarves, trolls and chaos creatures may not. The cult has shamans that worship Aldraya, and they must, after summoning their fetch, defeat the dreaded White Lady in spirit combat. The shaman's responsibility is the children of the forest, and they have access to spirit and divine magic. The High Elf King cult is open to any elf upon reaching maturity. Their duty is to protect the forest, military service, fighting fires, etc. An elf initiate receives a bow seed that they plant on their initiation day that within a year grows into their own elf bow, a living weapon that has a power score. Jungle elves receive a reed seed that they grow into a blowgun that functions similarly to an elf bow. The leader of the High Elf King cult is a woodlord. These are skilled elves that have been in the High Elf cult for five years or more. Upon initiation they are given various social and skill powers as well as having their elf bow awakened. Elder sisters are always dryads. The Gardener cult is open to awakened trees, shamans, elder sisters or woodlords and they must have served in that capacity for at least 20 years. We then have a list of special Aldraya spells that include things that you would expect like Accelerate Growth, Animate War Tree and Tangle Thicket. The spirit of reprisal for the cult of Aldraya exists in a form of like-for-like -like revenge. All harm done to the forest is visited upon the betrayer. 
Also, they are haunted by nature spirits who engage them in spirit combat at inopportune moments. Shinas, Aldraya's mate, is worshipped by all elves and is responsible for the food song spell. Aldraya has good relations with the cult of Shalana Aroy, Dendara, Aritha, Arinalda, Flamal, Gata, Yelm, Yelmalio, and Yelona. Elves that are exiled by their society are known as being rootless. Next up is the Trolls of Garanta, the Uz. Trolls are an ancient race, even old in god time, when age could not be measured and originated in the underworld. During the Lesser Darkness, trolls swarmed the surface world and were viewed as an invasion. However, the trolls had been driven from hell by the arrival of Yelm. When the Greater Darkness fell, trolls bore the brunt of the fight against chaos. At the First Dawn, trolls controlled much of the surface world and even cooperated with the First Council up until they decided to create a deity, at which point the trolls and dragonutes left, resulting in the Broken Council. When Gabadji was created, he cursed the trolls, overcame their goddess and broke a part of their soul forever. The Troll King Curse, as it is known, means that almost 50% of Dark Troll births result in stunted, malformed Trollkin. Attempts to break the curse result in great trolls and litters of Trollkin. The Troll King Curse has weakened the species. They aided our cat in his quest to destroy Gabadji, teaching him their powers and making him a troll, and they even march with him to meet Gabadji face on. There are a number of troll subtypes. Cave trolls are a monstrous, bestial offshoot that were tainted by chaos during the God's War, although despite this, other trolls feel a sense of kinship for them and do not persecute them. Dark trolls are considered the basic troll type. Great trolls are huge, lumbering beasts of limited intellect that are always male. Hot trolls inhabit the jungles and are taller and thinner than dark trolls. The mistress race are the original trolls that lived in hell. Only a few of these creatures are left. Mountain trolls are gigantic, carnivorous beasts that are tainted by chaos. Sea trolls live solely in the oceans and are frog-like. Snow trolls are quite similar to dark trolls and live in the northern frontier of Ganatella. Trollkin are puny, degenerate creatures that are often twisted and mutated. They usually live with dark trolls or even in packs on their own. Tusk riders or half trolls are a weird troll-human hybrid that are shunned by both trolls and humans who have a brutal society and are often hired as mercenaries. Female trolls are more often larger and taller than males, and they have snouted faces with protruding fangs or tusks. They're often hairy and fat, although their strength should not be underestimated. They tend to live underground or in caves, and sometimes in crudely constructed villages. They're almost immune to the cold. Trolls eat almost anything, gravel, flesh, pine cones, it doesn't matter to trolls, although they do thrive better on organic matter. Their favourite foods are dwarf and elf. Trolls speak dark tongue, one of the oldest languages of Garantha. Jungle trolls speak shadow speech. Trolls generally live in the mountains and are usually at war with dwarves and the elves. All trolls have an aversion to iron which they call the poison metal and they have a method of travelling in absolute darkness called dark sense. This is the type of sonar that allows them to move as a human would in daylight. Although trolls don't especially like daylight it doesn't harm them although cave trolls and trollkin are adversely affected. Troll families are matriarchal with the concept of fatherhood being alien to them. Male lineage is unimportant in troll society, matriarchal descent is all that matters. Dark trolls tend to live between 90 to 110 years. Trollkin usually only live up to 40 years. Trolls tend to live by human standards a very basic existence. Even a rich troll would look like they lived in squalor. Troll society has a strict pecking order. Mistress race trolls outrank pretty much everyone. Dark trolls outrank trollkin. Females outrank males. Elders outrank ordinary trolls. Dark troll females with the most dark troll children outrank other females. And with all things being equal, the bigger, stronger, tougher, meaner troll outranks their inferiors. A weak female, for example, with ten warrior children would be considered stronger. Trolls thrive in the Gori Inkarth, which is claimed to be the oldest troll settlement on the surface world. The land has been invaded many times but never conquered. They are also populous in the Erinoru jungle and Halakiv where the famous Castle of Lead is. Next up we have information on troll character generation. This section gives information on playing everything from mistress race trolls to trollkin. Following this we have information on Kai Galitor. Kaigalito is one of the oldest darkness gods. She mated with Manrune, and there in the underworld the trolls were spawned. Kaigalito walked freely amongst the living trolls there and founded many noble houses. When Yelm came to the underworld, Kaigalito joined the darkness deities to fight against him but was defeated. The trolls fled the underworld to the surface where night already hid. On the surface, the trolls fought ferociously against Wakboth and Chaos, often led by Kaigalito. Kaigalito built many castles of lead that attracted the greatest enemies of Chaos. Trolls from the Castle of Lead at the Gori Inkarth fought in the I Fought We Won battle where Chaos was defeated. After the defeat of Chaos at the Dawning, she was consulted and agreed to the great compromise that created time. In the Dawn Ages, trolls were very active politically. The Dawn Council even had a troll representative. The Troll King Curse did not destroy the trolls, but stunted their growth, and soon Troll King represented the bulk of troll society. Breaking the Curse of Kin is the primary objective of Kaigalito. The following section on the cult of Kaigalito is almost identical to the one presented in the Troll Gods box set, so please see my review of that for details of the cult. The following section is called the Lesser Elder Races. 
First up are baboons. Anglorantha baboons are a race of intelligent quadrupeds that live in a tribal society. They are generally treated badly by other races and as a result they are insular and mistrusting. They worship ancestors, grandfather baboon being the most important. We have details of generating baboon characters. Following this we have beastmen. Beastmen is a catch-all term that covers centaurs, manticores, minotaurs, satyrs, etc. These are written up in full in the deluxe RuneQuest box set. Brews are next. Brews originated during the God War when the dead god Ragnaglar joined the unholy trio in letting chaos into the world. Brew can generally reproduce with anything, although animal features are most common. Brews are hated by all living things. Even the famous wild healer of the Rockwoods, a brew cultist of Shlana Arroy, is hunted when sighted, even though their good deeds are plentiful. Generally, brews worship Thed and Malia. Some rules are given for rolling up brew characters. Centaurs are next up. Oddly, centaurs are included separately from beastmen while still being mentioned. When history began, centaurs were already extinct. The current living ones were either the result of grotesque experiments by the Empire of Wormfriends, or those that appeared at the end of the Second Age when old Seshnella was sunk. As expected, they are heard like in nature and are respected by all other nature folk. They generally worship Arachne Solara. Next up are ducks. Their origin is shrouded in mystery. They tend to worship the Orlanthi Pantheon, and some claim their origins are the mythical land of Gandaland. Giants are next. Inglorantha. Giants predate humans and some claim they even predate the gods themselves. There are grey giants that are a degenerate race and the Jolanti, a handsome race that look like they are sculpted from stone. They seem to have a fairly primitive culture where might equals right. They are, as you would expect, generally feared by other races and do not appear to be religious. Included the rules for creating giant characters. The Grotorons are next. Their origins are obscured. They claim to be the children of Enlistia, god of necessity, and Haribus Adronos, goddess of the land below the mountain, two unknown deities. They are gigantic humanoids with no heads. Instead, an arm sprouts from where the neck should be. On each hand they have an eye, and they have a wide mouth in their chests. They seem to not value material things and are omnivorous. They exist as bands of hunter gatherers and are considered a peaceful race that share the mountains with the elves. They are incredible archers and are valued as mercenaries for this. Although they have no organised religion, all Grotorons seem to have some shamanic skill. We have rules for creating them as player characters. Jelmri are next up. These lemur-like creatures dwell in the mountains. They are creations of Pamelt and are shy and reclusive. Rules are given for playing them. Following them we have Keats. Keats are a subspecies of duck found in the Eastern Isles. They believe that they are the descendants of an ancient and powerful race of the Golden Age. In most other aspects, they behave like ducks. Luatha are next up. They are a superhuman race of immortals and are described as being unsuitable to be played as characters in RuneQuest. They are descendants of greater gods, diminished in power but still outstripping mortals. They originally lived beyond the realm of time about the gates of dusk and they are described as gigantic, well-formed and graceful. They tend to have purple skin and violet hair and are resplendent in beautiful clothing and armour and they don't speak. They sing. They are inherently magical and can heal wounds, ignite fires, etc. without casting spells. Their culture remains an unknown, however, hero questers report them as having a highly developed civilization where crime does not exist. Luatha tend to ignore lesser races. They are feared in war. They decimated the Seshnegi army that outnumbered them a thousand to one. Their religious practices are unknown. The Ludok are next up. They are the most common race of mermen on Glorantha and tend to be neutral or friendly to mankind or are spiritual creatures that value beauty. Following these are the Morakanthi. They are a race of tapir-like beings that herd humans instead of beasts. They follow Praxian culture, although they tend to be generally resented by Praxian peoples. Rules are given for playing them. Newtlings are next up. These are a race of lizard-like creatures that are usually slaves to dragon newts. Ogres follow them. These are dark, evil creatures that worship Cacodemon. They hate all other races. Slarges are an aggressive race of reptile men that are hostile to humanity. They are growing in numbers as a species and exist in giants and lesser forms. They have a primitive culture, although they do practice sorcery. Following slarges are Timinits. They are an insect people that exist in many forms including the spider-like Arakan, the dragonfly-like Ephemerae, the beetle-like Lucan and the hive-dwelling Myrmidon. They seem to have no organised society or culture and don't practice any religion. The foul tusk riders are next. They are a loathsome race that are hated by all. Their name refers to their tusks and also their giant boars that they ride. They are said to originate in the second age, maybe from some foul experimentation by the empire of the worm friends. They're humanoid but extremely ugly and they lead a nomadic hunter-raider life and are often hired as mercenaries. Their religion is the cult of the bloody tusk and is incredibly brutal and cruel. Rules are given for playing one. The Varallans are next up. They believe that Mivaralla created them and are known as Black Elves. Rules are given on playing them in-game. The Wertagi are next up. Wertag, the first of their kind, was born in God time as a result of the union of Malkion, Prophet of the West, and Ludoc Mermaid. They were largely destroyed by the God Learners in the Second Age. They are green or blue skinned humanoids with long webbed fingers and toes. They are friends with the Brittany and always work with other sea creatures when they need to. They worship the Invisible God and the Merman Pantheon. Rules are given for playing them. 
Finally, we have wind children. They're a race of winged humanoid creatures that are hairless save for head hair and wear minimal clothes. They thrive in the open air and suffer severe claustrophobia. They're a flighty, independent race that enjoy freedom. They generally don't have any relations with other races, although they have an ancient prejudice for elves. They worship all anth. You can also play a wind child in game. Next up is details of the cult of the Bloody Tusk. Tusk riders claim that their deity is the god of the Bloody Tusk, a deity unknown and unacknowledged by others. They actually worship three gods, the hero Aram Yaudram, the god pig Gauja, and an unnamed darkness demon. Aram Yaudram was a human and one of the founders of the Empire of the Worm Friends. During the long night he captured a black demon in Dragon Pass. After the long night had ended, the Empire flourished and became complacent and no longer bore sacrifice or gave tribute to the Earth Goddess. Angered, she sent the great pig, the godchild, Gouger, to punish them. Although old, Aram was a wily fighter who tricked Gouger into the arms of his black demon. The pig was no match for Aram and the demon, and as it lay dying, Aram took the great tusks before he was buried, then freed the demon. Aram soon controlled the wild boars of the pass. He tamed them and trained the men of the valley to ride them. He established the temple of the ivory plinth upon the grave of Gouger. At some point, the humans who lived around the ivory plinth changed. It seems that they somehow inbred with trolls, and thus, tusk riders were born. The cult of the Bloody Tusk is associated with the runes of death, earth and beast. The cult is the main religion of the Tusk Riders as it supplies the giant pigs that they ride and somehow justifies their lifestyle as the cult has brutal violent practices. The cult's edict demand and even compel the Tusk Riders to carry out their barbaric acts. Any Tusk Rider can join the cult and non-members may join if they can subdue a Tusker with their bare hands. The lines between war leaders and cult priests is a blurred one, although those leaders who concentrate on gaining rune magic are called priests. The cult has a special skill called the Bloody Cut. This is a slaughtering skill that intends to end the life of the recipient in the most painful and traumatic way possible and it is intended to be combined with a death-binding enchantment. Their spirit of reprisal is a 10% cumulative chance per week that their Tusker will turn against them. They are associated with the cults of Aram Yaudram, the Darkness Demon and Gauja from whom they gain the spells Pain Tooth, Seal Wound and Appease Earth respectively. Following this we have the cult of Kakademon. Kakademon is a remnant of the army of the devil, Wakboth. When Wakboth was crushed under the spike during the Gods' War, Kakademon and others remained alive and embodied. They sowed disorder and chaos wherever they travelled, and Kakademon gained support of the Ogre race as well as others, and for a time ruled a wide area of Genatella. Trolls, aided by Waha, managed to drive out Kakademon to the hero plane with powerful magic, and Kakademon still resides there, using his race of servitor fiends to do his bidding. Kakademon can manifest on the material plane occasionally under extraordinary circumstances, but when it does, the opportunity for great destruction usually presents itself. The cult promises no life after death and is associated with the ruins of chaos, disorder and death. The cult exists only to spread violence and mayhem and is traditionally the cult of wild ogres, although other creatures can worship it. The cult hates everyone and everything, except cults and beings of chaos who are usually treated as neutrals. The cult has no power in the world except amongst ogres. The cult is usually driven underground and usually has shrines. Rune priests of Kakademon are known as Talons, and they serve as representatives of Kakademon on the material plane. Cult spells are centred around deception, with a like a detection blank and false form, and has the horrific vomit acid spell for those who get caught. The cult is associated with the cult of Thed and Primal Chaos. Divine intervention of this cult only results in one thing, Kakademon sending a fiend to reply. We also have the stats for fiends, and Kakademon itself. Following this, we have a few scenario ideas centering around dragon newt elves and dwarves, as well as a few minor scenario ideas centered around the lesser races. I won't go into them in detail here in case your DM plans to use them. In conclusion, Elder Secret of Garantha has good and bad points. The writing itself is, as you would imagine, coming from Sandy Peterson and Greg Stafford, top draw. The books are thick with lore, and one does wonder why this book was saved until last to be printed for the third edition line. Surely it would have made more sense to release this first in order to give players all the information they need to play the Uz, the Aldrei Army and the Mostali, as well as sowing adventure ideas for budding DMs with the scenario section. The cult write-ups are excellent, as is the information on the weather and the night sky of Glorantha. There are, however, some problems. Firstly, the art. As with Troll Gods, it is shockingly bad. Please see my review of Troll Gods for my feelings on this. Also, the set has a really cheap feel to it. I still can't get my head around why one of the books is only 52 pages long while the other is double the size. Elder Seeker to Garantha is a mixed bag of superb interesting writing marred by poor production values and awkward release timing. The material contained within, however, is just too good to ignore. I give this a very respectable 8 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to check out my other reviews. But out.